COVID-19 was spreading rapidly across the country. We had shut down schools at the end of uh, the last school year. We were thinking about um, whether we would open or not. Uh, we did uh, look at virtual learning just because that was one way to keep our children and the educators safe. Um, but it really was at that point in time, a week to week discussion and conversation. Aloha and good afternoon. The GEARS funds became available and we convened a group of advisors with many stakeholders represented. This was the most flexible funds that the federal government was providing as part of their COVID-19 relief funds. And we wanted to make sure that we should look for the opportunities that the funds would be most impactful. How can it change the trajectory of education? How can we make sure that it is more than just the immediate response to COVID-19? Thank you everyone for joining me here at the historic Washington Place. I think it's quite appropriate that we have this conversation on the GEARS, the Governor's Emergency Education Relief Fund grants, and all the great things that are happening with this program. It is a very innovative approach to grants and what schools can do in their classrooms and at their schools. So I'm really excited to talk and share with all of you about what's going on with the GEARS program and what can we expect. Daryl, if you can share with me, what was the approach that you took or the advisory team took with this whole program? Governor Ige's vision for education and for the future of Hawaii's economy has been focused on innovation. Should we use the funds like many states did for PPE or for things related to COVID? Or, or you could be innovative. Our charge was how can we you know, maximize the use of these resources and, and support, you know, innovation at, at a time when most people were not thinking about innovation. Because we were taking a different approach to uh, grant applications, we actually ended up with 208 applicants that applied for the GEAR funding. We came up with 74 out of the 208 that was forwarded on. We had international consultants as well as local educational experts uh, review these 74 presentations. And out of the 74, 31 were selected. So Steve, what was it like for an applicant to go through this process? What did they have to do and who did they have to present to? So as an applicant, we really focused on making it as easy as possible. We wanted to break the mold on what it's like to get a federal grant. So we really wanted folks to take a, a more of an approach just to focus on their big idea, their one big idea related to COVID and crystallize that down into, we had five slides that they gave within 15 minutes to a panel of the three expert judges that, that Karen talked about. So for the applicant, we we're hoping to create a, a sense of, of comfort where they could explore that space and, and, and put them in a, in a more creative and innovative mindset. So tonight we have our first educator workshop for the school year, which is focusing on teaching for artistic behaviour. And we have two facilitators who have flown in from North Carolina to talk about the TAB philosophy and pedagogy. So the base of the philosophy is what do artists do? Which is focused on student-directed, centred ways of teaching art and how to incorporate that in teacher classrooms. So that is one way that we hope that our educators can use the resources that are being created with this grant. Art is very much a part of our lives and should be very much a part of our education and our curriculum. It's a way to explore self-expression, to explore identity. I think there is an artist in every student and that's one thing that we as a museum I want to follow through with to make art as accessible as possible to the broadest number of people. 
I think one thing is looking at our museum as a resource, so utilising our collection. So along with the Educator Workshops, we also have a digital series, a video series, which looks at other ways of how one can engage with the collection. We had looking at visual literacy, how to read a portrait skills, how to engage students in conversations with artwork. We had a session that looked at how teachers could bring the students to the museum and facilitate their own tour with the students. Another way to reach our teachers and students was through our art packs. So we gave out free art packs with art making supplies that supported the art and practice videos that we had created. Hi, I'm Janet Tran and I'm a teaching artist here at the Honolulu Museum of Art. We've given out 215 art packs and each one of them it has enough supplies and materials for 30 students so for a classroom. So as far as we know, we have reached almost 6,000 students alone. And with that, we hope to give out another 150 or so art packs as well. And that was also supported by the GEAR grant. You know, hopefully it, it opens their world. You know, oftentimes after the pandemic, students look for alternative ways of just coping. And I always believe art gives students the chance to express themselves in ways that they feel most comfortable. It is one alternative to addressing social emotional learning. When we talk about uh, giving kids uh, the opportunity to be able to achieve within their area of interest and passion, it's not just reading and writing, it's also creativity and an opportunity to be able to demonstrate their skill in art. You know, Asset Schools is one of the awardees and I, they have an exciting project that they've completed about two months ago. Can someone share about uh, their approach to this grant and what their project is? So Asset's big idea from the very beginning, I think that caught the panel's attention uh, right away, was that they wanted to have a, a place where they could capture the needs of the students in real time. So they're calling it the Transforming Lives Center where any child in Hawaii can get tested for what their social emotional needs might be and what their, what their learning needs are, whether it's an accelerated learning need or, or whether it's, it's an, another type of special need. To have that identified free of charge for any parent, that institution where that child goes to school will be armed with the information to be more proactive in helping those children. We've all kind of had a formatted way of learning the schools because it was kind of created in, around the time of the Industrial Revolution by business people. It hasn't served all children as effectively as it could have. We have so many children in our state who learn differently. So for years and years, we have wanted to have a place where we could help with assessments to make sure that our Kiki are getting the type of education that's going to work best for their success for the long term. No other school in Hawaii can provide the individualized and specialized education that takes place at our two beautiful campuses. The Transforming Lives Center was a natural next step for us, one we've been aspiring to for quite a long time. at all aspects of learning. We're looking at physical, neurological, scientific, all of the things that comprise who we are as learners. Those things will be assessed and we're very excited. We have a really top-notch professional, Dr. Elsa Lee, coming in to head this for us and she's an expert in this field and so we feel like we're ready to go to help help children for the long term. Students with specific learning disabilities drop out of school nearly three times the rate of all students. So as a teacher, it was important for me to understand a child's academic challenge, which can be best identified through assessment. Children who come in here, they just felt like they were failures. They felt like they couldn't learn the way other children learned. And it made them feel bad about themselves. It made them you know, anxious and it affected their whole family. You see in just a relatively short time when we teach them the way they need to learn, it transforms them. It transforms them and it gives me chills to think of all the, all the young people in our state who could benefit and more will be benefiting now that we can test them and make sure they get the services they need and the education they need. The thing that I really appreciate 
appreciated about what these projects have done is because of their spirit of collaboration and partnership building, they've really expanded the learning environment way past the four walls of the classroom. And so when I think about a project like Camp Mokolea, they invited um, teachers to the camp to be exposed to going from a farm and having food picked at the farm to going into their kitchen at uh, Camp Mokolea with a chef who actually talked about sustainability. It's called Camp Mokolea's Mixed Plate Project and basically it's a farm to table concept where we're connecting kids and teachers and community members through food, so growing the food, making the food, and getting kids excited about eating it together. Thank you so much. All right, now. So today we were able to have a workshop with teachers and community members where we came together and we got to know one another. We talked about our dreams and what we would like for our classrooms as far as curriculum goes and planning their own mala, their own gardens. We went outside to our garden and we got to meet Clem Peshan, who is our local mahi'ai, and he gives us this great deep sense of connection to the land. This is medicine. You know that, that popola berries are medicine. And why it's important to garden and why it's important to be a mahi'ai, meaning caretaker of the earth. The kalo doesn't get as big as the rest. It stays small. And he really gave us this picture of it being so much more than just planting something in the ground and it comes up and then we eat it. You know, it's this deeper spiritual connection that binds us all together. It's a traditional art that we, we would like to preserve. No, it's, it's all good. <laughs> and then we came back to the dining room here where we're having a cooking demonstration. We're going to make a parashu. Parashu is like a pastry that, you know, if you eat cream puffs, Oh, yeah. Same. Today we have Chef Emily Iguchi from FET and it's a downtown restaurant that uses local produce. They have this, this sense of connecting with our community and really giving back. I'm so excited to use Kalo because this is such a, a good food and something that we have here. Food is, is that vehicle that can really bind us all together and that's what we want to bring here at Camp Mobilia, experiences like this one that will impact our, our children today and tomorrow. So the GEAR program was a special innovation grant that we received through the governor's office and an amazing opportunity that gave us the funding to bring all these people together to have this great experience this way to create a forward moving momentum of networking and change and that we really are so thankful for that support that it's given us and that it will continue to grow throughout the future. One of the other projects that I thought was quite innovative was Iolani School and they literally took apart COVID on the molecular level. You know, it's amazing. I did go to one of their teacher development classes and while it seems so very complex, part of the art in teaching is to take something so very complex and bring it down to a level that's exciting, interesting, and something that students can comprehend. But that's so, the whole idea that instead of being we're victims of COVID, we can, we can understand what this is and then we can help our society find a solution. Aina Informatics Network was developed to bring genome science into high school classrooms. And so we do that by providing equipment, curriculum, and expertise for teachers and students. When we talk about genome science, we're, we're talking about sequencing the genomes of different organisms. And for Aina Informatics, it's organisms particular are endemic to Hawaii mm -hmm. that help us solve problems in the community. One of the problems that we've worked on this year has been our COVID variant trackers project. So we're able to sequence the entire genome of the virus and then match those sequences to known variants. The technology is amazing these days. So we're using in particular the Oxford Nanopore MinION technology, and that allows us literally to sequence those genomes overnight in the palm of your hand. Wow. 
The genetics allows us to see unseen or undetected kind of modifications. Mm -hmm. And so we're looking at GMO versus non-GMO mm -hmm. papaya in mm -hmm. our community and mm -hmm. its prevalence from people's backyards or from school gardens mm -hmm. and that type of thing. Oh. We're using it to kind of help engage students mm -hmm. in understanding kind of the consequences of this technology mm -hmm. and the science behind the technology in their community. Mm -hmm. How many schools benefit from this program? I think we were able to add 14 more schools as well as expand to Kauai and Hawaii Island. Oh, that's great. So we're able to reach statewide. We know the traditional like breeding cycle. That real world authentic experience is what we're trying to share with the students as a scientist like that ability to actually do the work and get the sequence and be the first one to know the answer is um, super exciting. Kau High School they had a very comprehensive program on creating career pathways, college courses for their students. Just a very exciting program in terms of how they would grow their own food, learn about that process from all aspects of it, planting to the science, to the marketing, to feeding the community, which I understand they're providing hundreds of pounds of food to the community center to distribute to community members in need. So they're really, through their education, they're building a self-sufficient community. Uh, it's multifaceted because they've actually taken the teaching and learning into workforce development, and they're actually supporting the economic development of that community. You know, I understand for Kau in this year, they've graduated 18 students from Hawaii Community College's Certificate of Completion program. And that was just so exciting to be able to see students as young as ninth grade uh, receive those certificates on the stage at Hawaii Community College's graduation. So that not only gives them a sense of completion, which they did, but it gives them a sense of hope and motivation, we hope, to further their education. Coaching never stops. You will just get bigger brighter and better. These children, every child you create, creates a model and a ripple effect that will spread through Kau and other communities through the nation and the world to follow. You all can say, Kau is more than growing coffee, macadamia nuts, cattle. Kau grows people. We learn to move far and know when there is no positive path where we need to go we will create trails for others to follow. Congratulations and best wishes. Thank you for having me. When we, when we look at where, where we came from, we were in the midst of a COVID crisis, a global crisis, working in an atmosphere of, of fear, of uncertainty. Uh, for many, there is a sense of helplessness. Can we look at this opportunity and instead of being about fear, we're going to be about inspiration. Instead of being about um, helplessness, it's going to be about self-efficacy and collective efficacy. And hope. And hope. You know, education is the most important function that state government provides. This opportunity to empower educators at the front lines to come up with the best ideas for how to recover learning loss, to look at how to maximize the situation that we were in, and really deliver a program that allows students to pursue their dreams, uh, I do think will have a lasting impact on public education in Hawaii.